Before we get started this morning, take a moment to stay in your seat and turn around and give a point and a wave to people that you haven't seen in a while. That'll be our way of greeting this morning. So what announcements do we have this morning? There's a microphone about midway that I think is on if we want to. I know we're planning. Is it on? It is. I know, okay. I know we're planning a service here on Thursday evening at 7, kind of a tent of pray and communion that's in the bulletin. But I also want to extend the invitation for a full communion, a love feast at Liberty Mills if anybody wants to do that. Um, David Metzger is the deacon chair, board chair, I don't know, he's something, but he extended that invitation um, if you do want to participate in the love feast. Thursday at 7. Yeah. Thursday night at 7 is a love feast at Liberty Mills Church of the Brethren that we've been invited to attend. So, Other announcements? Roger, go ahead. I, I think this would be maybe as good a time as any about uh, particularly for the speaker of the morning, how did Mim and I meet Alicia daily? Well, it was about a year ago in, in Timbercrest. We were just, you know, the weather was getting nice, and so Mim and I were out walking, and there there were two people walking, and we didn't recognize them. It's like strangers walking by, and... Uh, uh, which is not an unusual thing at Timbercrest, but these were de definitely younger than the typical ones walking at Timbercrest. <laughs> and so we had to be curious and find out a little bit. And uh, we're really glad that we did, because as I think back of it, it's like entertaining angels unawares. And it has really proved true for us that Alicia has become a real angel for us that we're so thankful for and so it just numbers of things through the year developed then that we had developed this relationship and as I found out that she not only is a professor there with a, well it has it in the bulletin I think uh, uh, her doctorate in uh, social work which seems to fit right in with good brethren stuff and uh also, she's got degrees from two seminaries and is an ordained minister. So how could you go wrong? Someday we've got to get her here. And then COVID was on the scene. And so when this was opening up, we had to get her signed up. <laughs> so, and then also, uh, it wasn't Megan. Megan Polonay wasn't the one that was walking with her that day. But we got to know her along the way, too. And she's another special with special talents in music. And uh, she will be singing on that last hymn. That's a hymn for us. It's in our hymnal. But you should know that it is the African American National Anthem. And so what we do when we sing our hymns here is, is stand. But we got a double reason to stand because... The, in honor of the black American history, we can do that as she is singing. And I think we will want to sing along and lift every voice is what the name is. So that's the, the last part. And then uh, you can clarify this other, but at the end, some people may be leaving, but we don't want to spend a whole lot of time in getting started again for some people may have some questions and some conversation afterwards so somewhere around the 10 minute break, there'll be some music in between there, but gathering again, and then we can have some conversation with these two ladies after uh, the first service. Any questions? I'm just a little bit excited about it. Yeah. So, <laughs> well, we certainly welcome um, Dr. Daly and Dr. Is it Pauline? Am I saying that right? This morning. What other announcements might we have? Audrey's raising her hand from the balcony. We do need a few more people to read scripture for the Thursday evening service. 
So let me know if you plan to attend and if you'd be willing to read a scripture for that. Also, we need a few more questions for Jerry's interview. Thank you for all the people who sent in questions you want to know about Jerry, but we're getting ready to do that video. So let me know questions you may have for Jerry also. Thank you, Audrey. Any other? All righty. I think that's all the announcements we have. Let's ready ourselves for worship this morning. Today is Palm Sunday, the beginning of Holy Week, a week where we have the luxury of knowing the story. A lot can happen in just six days. In just six days, a crowd can welcome who they think is an earthly ruler with palm branches and the lane of cloaks and shouts of Hosanna and blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. In just six days, this ruler can clear a temple and declare, my house will be a house of prayer. In just six days, those in religious authority can ambush and undermine a rightful ruler and plan for his arrest. In just six days, what began as a joyous week can turn somber. A king can eat his last earthly meal and pray in agony to God until his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. In just six days, a betrayed king can suffer and utter such final words as, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. We long for the joy of Easter morning, but first we must remember the six days. Will you pray with me? Father, as we live out this week, let us think each day of the painful events leading up to the joyous resurrection. Let this knowledge strengthen our faith and our commitment. Today, we begin our journey by remembering Palm Sunday and those who rejoiced and shouted at the arrival of Jesus. Oh, that we could have seen that. Let us begin our journey. Amen. Okay, we've come to a time in our service where we share um, our gifts, and if you have not already done so, you are welcome to come up and do so. Our uh, special offering this month, the last Sunday of the month, is for the Sparrow Fund yet, so if you haven't donated to that, please feel free. Are this, is the other bowl for the Sparrow Fund, or does it all go in? It all goes in there? Either way. Okay. Let's dedicate these gifts with prayer. Lord, we commit these gifts to goodwill and good works in your name. Thank you for providing for us so that we can share our abundance. In your name we freely give. Amen. Well, Sarah, if you want to join us for a children's story, Roger has something neat he's going to do. I think Sarah's the only child, but any, any adult child is welcome to attend. I don't know how neat it will be, but with Sarah here, it's going to come out all right. Palm Sunday, uh, when uh, Jesus came to the temple area, that was a little bit different worship time. And uh, one of the things that was going on was that the children were having a lot of fun. And some of the old dudes that were in charge of the place, when Jesus does say, be quiet. But instead of that, he said, well, if they were quiet... Well, the stones would even start making noises and break it, raising God. And so he was not about to do that. And then in another passage, that was in Matthew, and then in Luke, it, the same deal was going on. And Jesus was saying, come on, you guys. It, it, don't, haven't you read that the children are the ones that are speaking and you should be listening to them and, what, and having some fun along with them as you worship God? So Sarah is going to help with that, and you've got some music that you can be playing along. And as she is doing that, you can get up and start doing it now. You can start making some noises 
and, doing it, and then we're going to sing, and you see in the bulletin, it has praise him, praise him. Now, I'm expecting you older dudes, you're, I'm talking about you and me, that you can make some noise, too, in singing this old hymn. It's number 465 in the old red hymnal. It's not in this one. We don't, they didn't get it in there. Praise him, praise him, all ye little children, all ye... God is love, God is love. That's the part that's not in the bulletin. That, that's all it is to it. Praise him, praise him, all you little children. God is love, God is love. And then that repeats. And then the next verse, instead of praise, you put love. In the next verse, you put thanks. In the last verse, you put help. So we'll see how that goes. And especially with the music going, you can be just doing that right along. But praise him, praise him. Praise him, praise him, all ye little children. God is love, God is love. Praise him, praise him, all ye little children. God is love, God is love. Love him, love him, love him, all ye little children. God is love, God is love. Love him, love him, all you little children. God is love, God is love. Thank him, thank him, thank him, all you little children. God is love, God is love. Thank him, thank him, all you little children. Help him. I think we're ready for the last one, aren't we? Sometimes I get, which verse are we on now? <laughs> the last one, the children are helping him, and we're all helping him. Help him, help him, all you little children. God is love, God is love. Help him, help him, all you little children. God is love. We could almost put a, something else on the end of that, you know. Amen. 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 One more time. Amen. 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 God, thank you for all the little children, all the children all over the world. Amen. Our scripture this morning comes from Mark 11, 15 through 19. I'm going to read you the New Century Version. When Jesus returned to Jerusalem, he went into the temple and began to throw out those who were buying and selling there. He turned over tables of those who were exchanging different kinds of money, and he upset the benches of those who were selling doves. Jesus refused to allow anyone to carry goods through the temple courts. Then he taught the people, saying, It is written in the scriptures, My temple will be called a house for prayer for people from all nations, but you are changing God's house into a hideout for robbers. The leading priest and the teachers of the law heard all this and began trying to find a way to kill Jesus. They were afraid of him because all the people were amazed at his teaching. That evening, Jesus and his followers left the city. I'm going to turn things over to Dr. Daly now. Thank you. <laughs> oh, yes. What is a joy to... Oh, I'm sorry. I can take this off. Thank you. <laughs> it is a joy to be with you this morning. And uh, Roger, you have been an angel in my life, you and Mim. <laughs> so uh, it, it's a mutual admiration society. Uh, but it's just great to be with you. And I've enjoyed the service and um, look forward to... Uh, having a conversation with some of you afterwards. And as you know, the uh, scripture has been read from Mark chapter 11, verses 15 through 19. 
And I've used, as you can see in the uh, bulletin there, that, that the title is Driving Injustice Out of the Church. Um, now, what didn't get into the bulletin was my subtitle, <laughs> which is okay, but that is house cleaning. Um, house cleaning. On Palm Sunday, we often hear sermons about Jesus triumphal entry into Jerusalem, sitting on a colt, and receiving the praises and adoration of the people. But what I want to talk to you today about is what happened after. On Sunday evening and Monday. That's what I want to talk to you about. <laughs> um, Mark, Matthew, and Luke all document these, event these events. Uh, but they vary on the, the details that they focus on and the order of the events. So for me, I'm going to use Mark uh, as the uh, primary uh, source here and then fill in with uh, Luke uh, to kind of give us a, a timeline of what was going on. Um, we're familiar with, you know, Jesus, you know, cleaning out the temple, but there were some things going on before that we need to be aware of for the, for the context. So the order of events, first you have the triumphal entry that we're all familiar with. And then late in the day, um, <clears throat> this is according to Mark, late in the day, Jesus looks into the temple. So he goes in there, he looks, and he sees what's going on. He doesn't do anything, though, at least in the Mark passage. He doesn't do anything then. He comes out, he goes with his disciples to Bethany, about a 30-minute walk away, and spends the night with the disciples in Bethany, overnight, so he sleeps. Gets up the next morning, Monday morning, starts going towards Jerusalem, where he had just left on Sunday afternoon and evening. On the way, it says here, the scripture says he gets hungry and he sees this fig tree. And he wants, it says there he wants to see if there's some, some fruit. He's hungry. And he sees leaves, but no fruit. And so then he curses it. Then the next thing that happens after that is then the scripture says that he weeps over Jerusalem. When I think of weeping, it's more than just a few tears. It, I'm thinking of almost uncontrollable emotion. He's weeping over Jerusalem because they have rejected God's salvation. In other words, they've rejected him, which in John says, you know, he came to his own and his own knew him not. So he's weeping. He weeps over Jerusalem. Then, according to Mark, then he goes into the temple, and this time he takes action. This time he drives out the money changers and the other unjust things that are going on, the other local merchants. But let's look for a minute, before we get to that part, let's look for a minute at the emotional states that Jesus probably experienced within a 24-hour period. Probably pleasure uh, at the adoration and adulation he was receiving from the crowd. Everyone's, you know, he was having the ticker tape parade, parade, parade. You know, he's coming in and they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So he probably was feeling pretty good with that. But then the next morning, and maybe even before, maybe when he had that look into the temple, I can guess he might have started feeling angry then in the evening, Sunday evening. And then slept on it. And then he, woke, he wakes up, goes with the disciples, He's on the way to Jerusalem, sees this tree, and he's hungry, and there's no fruit, and curses that. There's some anger there, too. Uh, 
And then the fact that he, that the, the, the tree symbolizes God's people, the Jews, and that they have rejected him and that they have been unfaithful to God causes him to weep. So you've gone from pleasure to anger to grief and sadness over, over his people not responding to God's offer of salvation, not responding to the Messiah who was with them. And then he goes in the temple, the place where God's presence is, and he sees all this stuff. He sees all this stuff going on that is unjust. And I would say it wasn't anger, because sometimes we have a misunderstanding of anger. So I'm going to say it was outrage. Outrage at the things that were going on in the temple of God. All these emotional states show us that Jesus was truly human, truly human, because he was experiencing all these emotions. He was not immune to things that were happening to him and around him. When we come to our text in verses 15 through 16, what is described is what I think could qualify for a special episode of CSI, Crime Scene Investigation. To give you some background, Herod the Great doubled the size of the Temple Mount. Now, remember, just to give a little bit of history, you had the first temple, which Solomon built. That got destroyed when, when um, Israel was dragged off to uh, captivity, the Babylonian captivity, and of course then there were attempts to later on to rebuild. And then Herod comes and what had already been built, he added on to it. It said that he doubled the size of it. And so there were, so you might consider, sometimes in our mind we think of a temple just being one, you know, building. There were, it was like a campus, okay, or a complex. You know, think of it as Manchester University with all these buildings on it. Um, it, it was like a campus, a complex. And so there were many buildings. And one of the buildings that Herod built was designated a sacred marketplace. So there was a law that whenever Israel, I'm not talking about the Romans here, but whenever Israel said that there, were, there was going to be a census, then all men who were 20 years old and above would have to come to the temple, and they have to do two things. They needed to pay tribute, and the second thing was they needed to make a sacrifice to atone for their lives. Well, you had Jews who were member under Roman occupation, so they were all over the Roman Empire, so not all of them had Jewish currency. And so, there Enter the money changers. Ah, we can help you with that. We will exchange your currency for bona fide Jewish currency just for a small fee. But it wasn't a small fee. It was extortion. But they were, what do you say? You, <laughs> Hard up, there's nothing you could do. This was, the, this was the only game in town. Actually, it wasn't the only game in town, but this was the one that the Sanhedrin, that the religious leaders sanctioned. Remember the one that Herod had, the sacred marketplace, that was a, a building, okay? Here, this, what the Sanhedrin did is that we're gonna have our own, we're gonna create our own game, and you will, you know, exchange, and you'll give us a kickback. All the merchants will give us a kickback. Um, 
and you will charge them X number of dollars or X number of whatever to, to change it, and you know, we'll, we'll have our cut. And then not only that, well, you know, the, the, the scripture says that um, some of you are supposed to give, um, have uh, birds, you know, turtle doves. And some of you are supposed to, to give those as a sacrifice. Well, you've, you've traveled a long way. We know birds wouldn't be able to make that long trip. Uh, so guess what? We've got, we have the answer for that too. We've got birds, 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 all that you would ever want. One of the main, there were two problems with that. Number one was the money issue again, overcharging. The other one was that they were not doing this where that had been set aside, that building that I told you about. They were not doing that there. They were doing this in the court of the Gentiles. And to understand that, <clears throat> the court of the Gentiles uh, was an area outside of the, you know, the, the temple proper, you might say, for me, lack of a better phrase, um, where Gentiles who, you might say, believed in God, believed in, in the monotheistic, believed in the one and only God, would come to pray. And this had been already, you know, set aside in, in, back in the Old Testament. So what they were doing, the religious leaders were taking space away from the Gentiles, squeezing them out so they didn't have a place to come to pray. Just so they could have their game in town and make their profit. And so the religious leaders had gotten caught up, gotten caught up in commercialism and greed. So here's come CSI. The crimes were many. The first crime was that the Sanhedrin, which was the legislative and judicial ruling body of the Jews, sponsored these things, sponsored these, this currency exchange at a high rate and sponsored uh, the, the sacrifices, paying for the sacrifices at a high rate and getting a kickback. They sponsored those things. The second crime was that, <clears throat> again, they, they sponsored the, the local merchants to sell the birds. The third crime, as I've mentioned, these are all three of here, the religious leaders got a kickback. The fourth crime was that as I've mentioned here, they conducted these activities not in the uh, appointed place, but in the court of the Gentiles where the Gentiles were trying to come to pray to the one and only true God. So that was, those were the crimes. In the crime scene, was the court of the Gentiles, where all this was happening. And not only that, but they, you know, you've got these merchants that had all these goods, these things, you know, and well, I've got, where, where do I put, how do I get my merchandise over to where I'm supposed to get it? So they would cut through the area that was reserved for the Jews. They would cut through there to get to the other side so that they could set up their booths. So that was the crime scene. You have the crimes, the investigator was Jesus. He found from his investigation, that's why I believe that Mark is probably maybe more accurate, but maybe not. But from his investigation, because he was there the day before and saw what was going on and then comes back and he knows, you know, he knows what's going on. He comes back and that's why he took action right away because he had already seen what was going on. And so <clears throat> he found that the religious leaders, instead of hating injustice, instead they were harboring injustice. 
So CSI doesn't just refer to crime scene investigation. I have another name for the uh, acronym. I call it church-sponsored injustice. Those, should be, those, two, those two words shouldn't, shouldn't even be in the same sentence. Injustice and church-sponsored. They shouldn't appear anywhere together. But that was what was going on. And one of the reasons Jesus was so outraged was because this wasn't the first time that this had happened. About three years ago, according to John chapter 2, he had already done some house cleaning at the beginning, near the beginning of his ministry. But unfortunately, and it happens today too, we get corrected and we go, we're okay for a little while, but then we start getting lax and kind of just fall back into the old pattern. So that injustice came right back. And there are some modern day, and I'm, this is where I feel like I'm just going to be like a trampoline. I'm just going to go, boop, and jump right off of it because it gets, it gets, you know, kind of touchy. Some of the stuff that's going on today. But nevertheless, the child sex abuse and how the Roman Catholic Church leaders covered it up for so many years, for decades. Another one I think of, and this one was actually a student told me this, how church leaders do not address domestic violence. A student told me I was going over domestic violence as part of my teaching, because I teach social work and sociology courses and so in one of my social work courses, I was teaching about domestic violence and, um, you know, and just think, you know, letting, bringing awareness to students and then, you know, what they need to do and those kinds of things. And a student came up to me in tears afterwards. She said, my grandmother was getting beat up by my grandfather every day. She went to her pastor. For help. Her pastor told her to stay in the marriage. Um, we don't want it to look bad. Fortunately, she did not take his advice, left to be safe, left that relationship, and I believe left the church, which would be understandable. And then you've got the commercial aspect. I'm not going to call names, but they've been in the news from time to time. You've got this minister who's, who has an anointed prayer cloth that you can buy. And when you buy the anointed prayer cloth, whatever you need, whatever the, the prayer is, and you, you pay, of course, you pay a fee for this anointed prayer cloth. You pay this. And once you get your anointed prayer cloth in the mail, then, then everything's going to be all right. Oh, and then there's this other minister that has a miracle water. Sometimes some, it's holy, you know, it's been, it's been anointed, it's been blessed. It's miracle water. Uh, right in to get it. And this, this minister, unfortunately, I'm going to say this because this minister would target African-Americans, low-income African-Americans, because he would have these testimonials of people who were mainly black at his meetings and talk about, oh, I got the miracle water and I followed the instructions and I got my job back and I got off drugs and this and this and this and this and this happened. And he would, he would write people and ask them, of course, to send them money 
and, and then they could get their miracle water. And I know this because my mother got those letters. To keep peace, I didn't say much, but I was, I was furious. I was furious. It was her money. I was her power of attorney. I had, I had power over the checkbook, but I gave her allowance, and whatever she did with that, that was, you know, I didn't want to, again, have tension. You know, that was, but I was angry at this man for taking advantage of a poor senior, my mother. Oh, and don't, let's not forget the telethons. Let's not forget those. Oh, they, and some of the ministers on these telethons, they preach, they, I mean, they could preach circles around me. They're just preaching, you know, great. But then there's a caveat at the end. You know, and they promise all these things, how God's going to bless you and yada, yada, yada. There's a caveat at the end. You've got to send in money to the certain ministry in order to receive those blessings. Now, for some reason, I don't recall Jesus saying that. For some reason. Not even in Mark. I don't even recall Jesus saying, um, in order for me to bless you, you're going to have to cough it up. And not only that, they would get specific. It wasn't to just send in a donation. It's send in this certain amount in order to get the blessing. And they would even go, go to lengths of picking a scripture and say it was Psalm 69:21. Send in $69.21. I mean, I've heard this. But in verse 17... Jesus models for us how to respond to injustice that's taking place in our midst. First, it says that he taught the people. And that's the first thing the church must do. We need to teach our own about injustice and justice and what do we do? We need to teach our own. We can't say a thing about society until we teach our own. And then the second thing is he confronts. Well, that's not the picture that we have of Jesus. Isn't he the mild-mannered? Oh, I just love, 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 love. No, when you look at his interactions with religious leaders who were being hypocritical and oppressing other people. He was, he was not mild-mannered. He was not Clark Kent. He said, you have made, he said, he said, my father's house is supposed to be a house of prayer for all nations. Remember, for Gentiles. That's how you have the Gentile court. He said, that's the what that's why the, the, the people of God are supposed to be able to have a temple where anyone can come and pray. That's that's the, that's the purpose. But you, he said, have, have made it a hideout. A hideout for robbers. You know the difference between a thief and a robber? Because some translations say thieves. Others say robbers. Robbers are actually more accurate, probably. A thief is someone who steals something, you're not around. They do it, you know, behind your back or in the darkness when you're not around. You know, when you're not paying attention or whatever. That's a thief. A robber is someone that in your face will take your stuff. And so Jesus is saying to the religious leaders, you are harboring robbers who will just rob people right in their face. Right in their face. You're taking their money, charging this terrible interest rate right in their face. 
squeezing out the Gentiles so they can't come and pray right in their faces. That is some bold sinning. He said, and you. So he confronted. And so he models what we need to do. And we as a church, sometimes we're too soft. I know we don't want to judge, but we are supposed to keep each other accountable. If we had been more, and I'm just saying large C church. I'm not saying little. I, mean, I don't know your business. <laughs> you know, don't want to. <laughs> I'm just saying is we, the body of Christ, would do better on the accountability side. We'd have less on the scandal side. If Jimmy Swaggart had been taken, had been hold, held accountable, he wouldn't have been watching a prostitute have sex. Scripture says, iron sharpens iron. In Proverbs 27, 17, another one uh, in Proverbs says, faithful are the wounds or, or the rebuke of a friend. You need people who are going to tell you the truth and say, you're going the wrong way. Let me help you. And not in a haughty way. Scripture says you restore people uh, with, with an attitude of gentleness, knowing that you can fall and do the same thing. And so last, verse 18. Verse 18 just is, again tells the truth. It says they got mad at Jesus. They, and they decided, they said, we're going we're gonna to get rid of this. Now, I'm sure they didn't call him rabbi. Whatever they were going to call him, a cuss word in Hebrew, I don't know. But <clears throat> let us not be deceived into thinking that driving injustice out of the church will be easy. There is a cost. There is a price. People will get upset. People will push back. People will get defensive. They may even become violent. People, and it says here, it says here, because the reason why they were doing all that, because it says they were afraid of him. And when people are really, really afraid, that's when they become very dangerous because they feel like they've got to hold on to what they have and they don't want to change. And you're in the way, you're, you're talking about change and justice and, and treating people right. And, all, and they don't want to do that. They want to just take care of me, myself, and I and you are threatening that, they're going to get mad. So actually, when people are afraid of you and doing those kinds of things, that's a good thing. Because it means you're doing the right thing. It means you're doing what God has asked you to do. And that is to stand against injustice and stand for justice. If we want to address racism in society, we've got to address it in the church. If we want to get... Address sexism in society, we've got to address it in the church. If we want to address unrestrained, selfish ambition in society, we've got to deal with it in the church. Silence isn't always golden. Silence can be dangerous. As some were talking earlier, we have to stand when our Asian friends, our Asian American friends are being threatened and killed. We have to say something. We have to speak up about health disparities. We have to speak up about pro police brutality. We have to speak up when a city like Flint poisons the water of primarily poor African Americans. We have to speak up. Because if we don't, if we allow the injustice to continue, Without saying anything, then Jesus is going to take an inspection and look. And then might have to do some house cleaning. And I can tell you, I'd rather pay the price for people pushing back at me than to have to endure the house cleaning by the Lord. Now, I don't know about you, but that's how I feel. <laughs> and so... I want to end here. We, we can do these things. We can with the help of the Holy Spirit, and that's the only way we can. 
But there's a, a, a black gospel song that's called If You Can't Live It. And it just says, if you can't live it, don't sing about it. If you can't walk it, don't talk it. There's no need to dance and shout it. God is looking for someone who will give sincerity. God is looking for a people who will truly praise his name. Amen. Now we would like for you, if you are able, uh, to stand. And uh, Dr. Megan Polonay is going to come and lead us in the African-American hymn, Lift Every Voice and Sing, number 579 in your book.
tears thou who hast brought us thus far on the way thou who hast by thy might led us into Stray from the places, our God, where we met thee. Lest our hearts, drunk with the wine of the world, we forget thee. beneath thy hand. May we forever stand true to our God, true to Let us receive the benediction. I'm sorry. Let us receive the benediction. And so it begins. We walk through this week from palms now to passion. It's Jesus we seek. Each moment we walk through these days now with Jesus is time to see people the way Jesus sees us. To watch for the ones who need hope, who need kindness, seeking the light, not the darkness that blinds us. As you walk through these days, may the love you now know be spread to each person you meet on the go. And may God, who now blesses and keeps you in love, whose face shines upon you with grace from above, who looks on you with such joy and such favor, this God, three in one, gives you peace, life to savor. Amen. <laughs>